the illegal liquor is unloaded on the beach. Carl Ryder and first mate Johnny Johnson are taken to the hospital in critical condition. Ryder with a belly full of gunshot wounds. They was laid in the hospital there for two or three days and the doctors kept looking at him, looking at him. He says, well, Carl, he says, there ain't no chance for you, he says. Carl told him right back, well, if I'm going to die, bring me something to drink. So we, we uh, took four quarts and put them in a gallon jug and he had the nurses, everybody feeling good in the hospital there. And in about a week, they looked at, the doctors looked at him again and said, Jesus, that gin is... He's probably just cleansed your kidneys. He says, you, you're doing all right. He says, you're healing up point. As far as Johnny Johnson, who had gotten shot through the head, the bullet actually went right through the front cavity of his skull. Three days later, he woke up, and for the rest of his life, he was fine. And that's the story. Carl Ryder repairs the Artemis and returns to Rum Row along with thousands of other rum runners smuggling illegal liquor into the country. When Prohibition is repealed in 1933, Ryder and his fellow rum runners return to their everyday lives as fishermen. Every year until their deaths, Johnny Johnson and Carl Ryder meet on the anniversary of the infamous battle and drink a toast. They love the adventure, they love the times, they love the seas. This is what they did. This is what they did. The Detroit River, a narrow waterway that separates Detroit, Michigan, and Windsor, Canada, in some places by less than a mile. Peaceful today, these waters were once turbulent. During Prohibition, this is the epicenter for illegal alcohol in America. It is known as the Detroit-Windsor Funnel. An estimated 75% of all the liquor smuggled during Prohibition comes across this waterway. Detroit was a wild, wild town in the 20s. The illegal liquor business here in 1925 was conservatively estimated to be a $250 million a year business, employing 50,000 people. No other place in, 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 the, in the United States offered this opportunity with the availability of liquor on the one side and the market on the other side. Canada has its own dry law, but when the United States passes the 18th Amendment, they see an economic opportunity. So Canada modifies their law and legalizes the production of alcohol for exportation only. The Canadian government looked at it this way. We'll license all of these distilleries and breweries. It'll employ thousands of people and give them jobs. We'll uh, add a tax on for every quart produced, and we'll make a large amount of money uh, as a result of it. In Ontario alone, 29 breweries and 16 distilleries begin producing alcohol for export. Many are located near or on the Detroit River. The Windsor side of the river was lined with export docks, so you went over there in a rowboat and said, I'd like to get 50 cases of uh, Canadian Club. So they give you the 50 cases and they say, where's your destination? You'd say Cuba. When you left the dock, nobody cared where you went. Boats deliver a constant stream of liquor to Detroit. In the winter, a frozen river makes it even easier to get to Canada. People did all kinds of things. They bought $5 jalopies, Model T's, and they took the doors off the side and they ran them across in areas where the Detroit River used to freeze over. Some of these people would even carry 12-foot or 15-foot planks, if you can imagine, and actually try to drive the car from one ice floe to another. It was just a completely insane atmosphere. People would do anything to try and get booze over here. Automobiles were redesigned, rebuilt, so there were places now to store liquor. Trucks were, had uh, separate compartments underneath the, the cartage area.
sometimes they would use a hearse. It came to the uh, attention of U.S. Customs once. Why are the Canadians coming over here to get buried? And uh, finally, the customs agents checked and discovered that indeed there was a casket in the hearse, but uh, the casket was not with the deceased, but laden with uh, very expensive Scotch whiskey. The passenger ferry crossing the Detroit River provides ample opportunity for everybody to get into the smuggling game. This is Nell Rhodes. In 1931, she modeled the fine art of smuggling liquor in hot water bottles for the Detroit Times. They were filled with alcohol and placed uh, like suspenders across the shoulders and down the back underneath her coat, usually women. And after making several trips, they made quite a bit of money by bootlegging that way. It was on an individual basis. The average annual salary in the 1920s is less than $2,000 a year. Many rum runners could make that much in two weeks. But this is nothing compared to what big-time bootleggers bring in. George Remus, a lawyer turned bootlegger, is reported to have made over $80 million during the first two years of Prohibition alone. Joseph Kennedy is believed to have made much of his fortune exporting alcohol from Canada during Prohibition, financing a dynasty that culminates with his son's election to the White House. But possibly nobody benefits more from Prohibition than the gangster. One of the terrible consequences of prohibition was that it really bankrolled organized crime in this country. It took a lot of basically pickpockets, two bid thugs out the street, and made multi millionaires out of them. It is blood money that lines the mobsters' pockets, spilled by thousands who suffer grim and untimely deaths at the hands of men like Dutch Schultz, Bugsy Siegel, and Al Capone. But the violence of these notorious thugs is rivaled and often surpassed by a group of young Jewish gangsters who ruled Detroit's underworld. They are the Purple Gang. The Purple Gang was a very violent, high-profile group of mobsters that basically were very heavy on muscle and very light on brains. They were totally, completely ruthless. The Purple Gang is led by the Bernstein brothers, the sons of honest, hard-working immigrants who came to America in search of a better life. But the Bernstein boys have other ideas of how the American dream should be attained. The Purples did not make their reputation as rum runners. They made their reputation as hijackers and strong-arm men. If they were out to kill somebody, they'd walk into a crowded restaurant or a crowded theater or wherever and find the person that they were looking for and shoot them and maybe shoot two or three other people in the process that just happened to get into the way. 